Welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we explore the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Episode 24 West End Games and Greg Kostikian. Last week, we boldly went where eh, tons of gamers have gone before, looking at both Star Trek and Star Wars in role playing games. Today, we're going to break down two of the key players in bringing Star Wars to the role-playing world, West End Games and Greg Kostikian. Let's begin with West End Games. West End Games was founded in 1972 by Scott Palter, who started the company shortly after not only getting his Juris Doctorate from Stanford, but also going to work at his family's firm, Bucci Imports. Palter decided to name the company for the bar that held the meeting that finalized the financing for the company, as the West End Bar was located on Broadway near Columbia University in New York City. For the record, the West End Bar closed in 2014, which is considerably longer than West End Games would make it, but we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. When it was founded, West End Games, as so many other game companies at the time did, was in the business of creating war games. Salerno, Operation Avalanche, dropped in 1977, followed by Marlboro at Blenheim in 1979. West End Games would develop about a dozen more war games over the years, and while they were each at least mildly successful, none of them were what would be described as genre-changing games. However, reviews across the board commented on the attention to historical detail, as well as the attempts to put the player of the game into the battles the games were portraying. So, needless to say, West End Games had, from the beginning, a reputation for detail. But if your goal is to change the gaming landscape, being good isn't enough. You need to find a way to be great. With that in mind, in 1983, Palter hired Ken Rolston, Eric Goldberg, and Greg Kostikian as game designers, with their mission being to steer the focus of West End games away from war games and into other areas. Kostikian hit first. In 1983, he developed Bug-Eyed Monsters. It was not only a board game, but also West End Games' first foray into the science fiction genre of games of any type. It was well-reviewed and well-received and helped West End Games break out of the mold of being just a war game company. However, it was the next new release from West End Games that would change the fortunes of the company. Kostikian and Goldberg brought Palter the manuscript for a role-playing game that their friend Dan Gelber had originally conceived. Palter was impressed by that game and agreed to buy the rights to it. Ken Rolston was tasked with doing some editing and polishing of the game, and it was released by West End Games at Gen Con in 1984. That game? Paranoia. Now, we've talked about Paranoia before in the podcast, as I gave some background on it during the role-playing game timeline we did early on. And since we're going to do a deep dive of the game on next week's show, I don't want to spoil things by getting too deep into it this week. But, Paranoia plays a lot like it sounds. Players are supposed to be paranoid about everything and everyone, since you never know who your friends are, who your enemies are, and if things are what they appear to be. I'm telling you, if you don't need therapy before you play this game, you're probably going to need it afterwards. But it's a guaranteed fun ride nonetheless. Paranoia took off like gangbusters. It sold well, was very well reviewed, and won an Origins Award for Best Role-Playing Rules of 1984. One of the reasons for the success of Paranoia was its production quality, and that was noted in review after review. And it should be noted that production quality is something pretty much all West End Games products were noted for. That came because of the high production values that the war games industry has always demanded. Going off topic for a minute, you might be wondering why the war games industry has such a demand for high production quality. To understand that, you have to understand the war games industry as a whole. We, we may do an episode on war games at some point, just because there's so much meat on the bone that we can chew on that connects to role-playing games. 
When it comes to war games, there are a ton of companies that produce products. I mean, you can find war game products that cover pretty much any type of war game scenario you can imagine. Whether you're looking for medieval war games, civil war games, the world wars, space wars, I, I think you get the point. So to set themselves apart in a very crowded field, companies had to up the quality of their products. The idea being that the better the quality of the figs, the maps, the terrain, and the other materials, the better the chance the wargaming public might buy their products over somebody else's. That's the level of quality that West End Games brought to the table, and they were able to very easily transfer that focus from war games to role-playing games, and it showed. If by chance you've got a copy of that original Paranoia game from 1984, so long as it wasn't like thrown off the roof of the building, it should have held up pretty well, even 37 years later. The quality of the pages, the binding, and the printing were just that good. Okay, so let's get back into West End Games. That quality in production we just explored meant that, in the mid-1980s, West End Games was one of the very few companies who actually had the ability to compete with TSR in the gaming market. Now note that I said compete with TSR, not beat Dungeons & Dragons. The second one wasn't going to happen. But as we know, TSR tried things other than D&D over the years and didn't have the same levels of success. West End Games was one of the reasons why. Off the success of Paranoia, West End Games pushed for more. The company managed to acquire the license from Columbia Pictures for the movie Ghostbusters, with the plan being to produce a role-playing game based on the widely popular and successful film. Ghostbusters, a frightfully cheerful role-playing game, was released in 1986. Designed by Sandy Peterson, Lynn Willis, and Greg Stafford, this game also has the historical designation of being the first game to utilize what would later become the D6 system. In this game, the original Ghostbusters form a corporation known as Ghostbusters International. That company sells franchises around the world. The characters in your game will have purchased a franchise for their city, and the paranormal activities take place in that setting. By the way, it's assumed your game takes place in a city other than New York, since that's where the movie took place. But should you wish to run a game with the original Ghostbusters, the designers worked up character profiles for our movie heroes, so the ability to run a game in New York with the originals certainly existed. The game also included vampires, extraterrestrials, and time travelers as possible adversaries for the Ghostbusters crew, along with a ton of paranormal oddities. Now, I mentioned the basics of the D6 system in last week's episode, so if you want to know more about that, that episode is available in the archives wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, and it will have just released today on YouTube if you happen to be a subscriber. The game came in a box, as was starting to become the trend in the mid-1980s. It had a 24-page player's handbook, a 64-page game master's handbook, six six-sided dice, and several handouts for use in the game. West End Games also produced three accessories for this original version of the game. Hot Rods of the Gods was an adventure written by Daniel Greenberg and released in 1986. Scared Stiffs was an adventure that dropped in 1987 and was written by Bill Slavicek. Ghost Toasties was an adventure that had an added bonus of a Ghost Master screen. It was developed by Scott Herring and published in 1986. In 1987, Ghostbusters won the H.G. Wells Award for Best Role-Playing Rules of 1986. Based on the success of this version, West End Games published a second version in 1989. Called Ghostbusters International, it revised the rules from the original version and had the dual purpose of satisfying players of the original who wanted a more detailed rule set, as well as attempting to capitalize on the release of that year's Ghostbusters sequel. This box had a single 144-page rulebook, six six-sided dice, and more handouts. Five accessory supplements were published for the game over the years, all new adventures for use with these rules. While Ghostbusters International was fairly well-reviewed, its sales weren't as good as its predecessors, and the license was eventually allowed to expire. 
It goes without saying, therefore, that the game is no longer in print and can be very difficult to find in good condition used. However, it's not impossible, so if you're interested, pop it into your Google search and give it a run. Drive through RPG would also be a source you could utilize, but then you'd be getting it in digital form so you wouldn't get the cool box or the dice. Now, we mentioned last week that the Star Wars role-playing game was released in 1987. As I said earlier, a full breakdown of this game is available in last week's podcast, so I'm not going to repeat myself here other than to mention yet again that this is the game that really solidified the D6 system into what is still being used today. One other nugget I dug up while researching West End Games that I didn't have last week is that West End Games also released Star Wars role-playing games sourcebook supplements for each of the three books in Timothy Zahn's book trilogy from 1992 to 1994. So, not only was the Star Wars role-playing game an inspiration for new books to be written and released, but those books then became inspiration for new gaming materials to be created. Because it's the circle of life. Okay, I promise I will never do that again. Torg was the next big release from West End Games. Released in 1990 and designed by Greg Gordon and Bill Slavicek, Torg is set in a near-future setting called the Near Now. This world, as the game starts, has been subjected to an interdimensional invasion by a series of high lords who have changed the natural laws of large swaths of Earth to reflect those of their home dimensions. The players take the roles of Storm Knights, people from Earth in the various invading realms who possess limited reality-altering abilities and stand in opposition to the plans of the high lords. Torg is what is known as a cinematic game, and therefore tried to emphasize gameplay in a very cinematic way. Adventures were divided into subunits called acts and scenes. Actions are resolved by rolling a d20 against a difficulty number, which isn't unusual. What is unusual is that the degree by which the roll exceeds the difficulty number influences how successful the player is at that action. Also, rolls of 10 or 20 allow the player to roll again, adding that new number to the previous one. Torg also has a wound system, which stresses incapacitating damage over lethal damage, and allows for the cinematic style of the badly wounded character just managing to succeed at the test. Torg also used a card-based system called the Drama Deck. Each player had a hand of cards dealt to them at the beginning of a game. Cards could be used by both the players and the game master to influence play. Whenever combat began, the GM would flip over a card, and that card would dictate certain advantages or disadvantages for both the players and the NPCs for that conflict. Players could also use the cards to give themselves advantages or plot lines that could be beneficial to them in the long run. The title of this game was an inside joke at West End Games. The creators originally used a title for the in-house discussions of it, The Other Role-Playing Game. When they couldn't come up with anything better, Torg became the official name. In 1992, West End Games dropped a set of updated rules for Torg to both clean up some issues from the original and present some new rules that had been created after the game's release. The game itself was very well reviewed and initially sold well, even in a market that was loaded with role-playing games in the early 1990s. However, over time, the game began to lose popularity. Writers have theorized that there were a number of factors for this. First, there began to be a quality control problem with new products being released, not just for Torg, but across the West End Games lines. This really annoyed some gamers and obviously turned them off to the product. Second, there was the amount of required game materials that you needed to purchase in order to get the whole game experience. There were not only the rules, but also the cards, the adventures, and all the other supplements that came out over time. And by the way, there were a lot of things that came out in a very short amount of time. 
Last, West End Games never embraced the internet as a possible resource for its products and games. Now, having been in my early 20s in the mid-1990s, I can understand how today's kids would wonder how in the world that could happen. But for those of us who grew up without the internet, well, we, we know we had no clue this was going to go over the way it did. However, <laughs> gamers were, as we tend to be, among the groups who embraced the internet from the beginning. And while other companies got their names and products out there quickly, West End Games didn't, and it would eventually wind up being the nail in their proverbial coffin. Now, I'll have a few more words about Torg in a few minutes, so I'm going to just stop right there on this game for, for this moment. 1994 saw West End Games release Masterbook. Designed by Ed Stark and staffed with a half dozen top illustrators, Masterbook was created to be a set of generic rules that could be adapted to any type of campaign. It borrowed heavily from Torg in that it utilizes both dice and cards for conflict resolution. In Masterbook's case, 2d10 were rolled when dice rolls were needed, and the Master Deck replaced the Drama Deck from Torg. Now, knowing that some gamers would want some settings to actually use with their Masterbook, West End Games released games licensed to Indiana Jones, Necroscope, Species, Tales from the Crypt, Tank Girl, and World of Aiden that would all run on the Masterbook frame. Masterbook was shredded by reviewers. Pretty much all of them hated the game system, hated the rules, and hated the concept. The only positive I got from the reviews I looked at were a lot of niceties about the quality of the print and the illustrations. And for the record, Indiana Jones was the only game out of the settings I mentioned above that had any real success, and it was ultimately adapted into the D6 system. Later in the 1990s, West End Games released the Hercules and Xena role-playing game. Needless to say, finding anything about this game online is very difficult to do. It didn't sell well, wasn't widely reviewed, and it bombed on release. It was also the final nail in West End Games' coffin. In July of 1998, West End Games went into bankruptcy. The stated reason for the bankruptcy was mismanagement between West End Games and its parent company, Bucci Retail Group, which, by the way, is a shoe importer. When Bucci filed for bankruptcy, West End Games was forced to as well. Scott Poulter attempted to save his company and tried a Chapter 11 reorganization of the finances. However, this wasn't meant to be. Eric Goldberg and Greg Kostikian took Poulter to court, arguing over the ownership of paranoia. In 2000, the courts ruled in Goldberg and Kostikian's favor, and the license to paranoia reverted to them. Now, normally this would be where we'd stop our discussion of West End Games. However, the assets of the company have continued to change hands over the years, and this story is so interesting, I thought it would be in our best interest to continue. So the year is 1998, and West End Games is bankrupt. As part of the process of dispersing assets, the company name was changed to WEG Creative Design Group. In March of 1999, a new West End Games, also known as D6 Legends, was formed in partnership with Yeti, which was a French design house, publisher, and subsidiary of Humanoids Publishing. The court overseeing the WEG Creative Design Group's dissolution allowed them to sell D6 Legends, their intellectual property, and the licensing contracts for Paranoia, which at this point they still had the rights to. The licenses for Indiana Jones, Star Wars, and Xena remained with WEG Creative Design Group, Though, as I just mentioned, Xena wouldn't get into the printing. And, as you'll remember from last week, Wizards of the Coast got the Star Wars license in 2000, so there's that. D6 Legends made a big splash at the 1999 Gamma Trade Show. They announced a third edition of Paranoia for June or July of that year, plus a Bug Sector supplement. They also announced the acquisition of the DC Universe license, plus a new role-playing game for DC. After all of these announcements, the DC role-playing game was the only thing that ever saw the light of day. 
It was released in 1999 and almost as quickly forgotten about. For whatever reason, this announced third edition of Paranoia didn't drop, and the Bug Sector supplement was abandoned as well. Humanoids Publishing decided to take advantage of the D6 system they'd acquired when they bought D6 Legends and created a role-playing game based on the Meta Baron's graphic novels. If you've never heard of that, you are not alone. This game absolutely shit the bed and led to Humanoids Publishing abandoning the role-playing game market. They sold off D6 Legends at the end of 2002. Now, before they did that, though, on July 1st, 2002, they made the D6 Classic, D6 Legend, Masterbook, and Torg systems available via license to any publisher who wanted to use them. Okay, so now the company's done, right? Nope. So we can avoid confusion. Mine, not yours. I'm going to go back to referring to D6 Legends as West End Games. I mean, it was always known like that, but for the last section, I was calling it D6 Legends so that we wouldn't get confused talking about two versions of West End Games. Okay? Okay. Do my Joe Pesci. Okay, 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 okay. No, I'm kidding. In November of 2003, Purgatory Publishing purchased West End Games. Eric Gibson, the owner of Purgatory, moved the company out of New York and settled it in Downingtown, Pennsylvania in 2004. Gibson moved quickly, getting a revised edition of Torg in 2005 and publishing a generic version of the D6 system for designers to create with. While the Torg version was probably a good idea, the D6 system release was not, as it led to a line of irregularly produced supplements. However, good ideas or not, fans tended to applaud both of these developments. But that applause didn't translate into sales, apparently. On the official West End Games Forum in 2008, Gibson announced that none of the D6 products produced since he'd acquired West End Games had turned a profit, and West End's other role-playing game lines weren't performing as well as expected. He estimated his total losses at the time to hundreds of thousands of dollars. However, Gibson did find a way to turn some profit. He expanded West End Games back into board games, dropping a new version of the board game Yunta, which he reported turned a good profit for him. In 2007, the company announced a new science fiction role-playing game. Developed by Bill Coffin, the game was to be called Septimus. Pre-orders of Septimus were offered, but then the delays began. After a number of these, Gibson announced that the game had been canceled in March of 2008. In July of 2008, Gibson announced that West End Games couldn't afford to provide refunds on the pre-orders and couldn't even afford the postage to ship books to folks who would rather have other West End Games product instead of their money back. Needless to say, this caused a wee bit of a backlash, and Gibson announced that he was planning to sell all of West End Games' properties, though he didn't do that at the time of the announcement. Eventually, Septimus was released via PDF and print-on-demand. And please don't ask me about Septimus. Just, just don't. Put it down. Back away. We're moving on. In 2010, Gibson did a podcast interview that shed some light on why there had been the issues there had been with West End Games. Gibson said he'd been perhaps foolishly optimistic about the sales potential of the brand because the name West End Games would carry a lot of weight. Further, he stated that his optimism caused him to print more books than he could sell, and he wound up destroying most of the books to save on the storage costs. In a prior interview, he announced that he'd planned to release the D6 system under the terms of the open game license, not only to, he hoped, increase sales, but also to, as he said, protect it from myself. What he meant by that was that if the company had to be sold or otherwise went out of business, the system would still be available to the general public. Now, this was one promise Gibson kept. In 2009, West End Games released the D6 system to the public, with the license being known as Open D6. However, it was too little too late. The Septimus debacle doomed Purgatory Publishing, and they sold off most of their properties. 
In June of 2010, Torg was sold to the German game company Ulysses Spiel. In July of 2010, Masterbook, Shatter Zone, and The Blood Shadows were sold to Pressis Intermedia. West End Games and its remaining properties, which was basically the D6 system, were purchased in April of 2016 by Nocturnal Media. You might remember the name Nocturnal Media, as it was owned by Stuart Week, the founder of White Wolf Publishing. Nocturnal had a plan in place when they purchased West End Games. They fully intended to keep the brand alive using whatever properties the company still had to do so. First up was the announcement of a revised edition of Greg Kostikian's 1984 board game, Web and Starship. A Kickstarter for the project was launched in April of 2016 and was successfully funded. However, that game would never be released. Stuart Week died in June of 2017, and that led to the cancellation of the project. However, it didn't lead to the end of West End Games. Week's successors at Nocturnal arranged a licensing deal with Gallant Knight Games to publish a second edition of the D6 system in October of 2017. So, West End Games might be on life support, but it still lives on under the umbrella of Nocturnal Media. Oh, one final note on West End Games. The founder of the company, Scott Palter, fell ill and unexpectedly died on February 17th, 2020. So, with the death of the company founder, let's bring this part of the tour to a close. But we're not done yet. Part two of the tour begins now. Let's do a deep dive into the life of the game designer and science fiction writer, Greg Kostikian. Greg Kostikian was born on July 22, 1959 in New York City. His father, Edward, was an attorney and politician in New York. Now, Greg doesn't discuss his personal life or childhood very much in interviews, so we're going to focus most of our attention today on his career. We've mentioned his name, and I've butchered saying his name, a lot during the history of this show. He's been a game designer since the 1970s. He started at Simulations Publications Incorporated, which was a company that published a variety of board war games, such as Star Force Alpha Centauri. He worked for SPI until the assets were purchased by TSR and the company was closed in 1982. Now, as we discussed a bit ago, he moved to West End Games in 1983. It was his creation, Bug-Eyed Monsters, that launched West End Games into the sci-fi and fantasy genres of games. The basics of Bug-Eyed Monsters, by the way, involves alien invaders, kidnapping women in one of the provided scenarios, and Dwight Eisenhower in the other. Matt Costello reviewed the game in Space Gamer 68 and called it first rate. From there, Kostikian and Eric Goldberg brought Paranoia to West End Games. What I didn't mention up front on that was that Goldberg and Kostikian had the license for Paranoia. So West End Games licensed it from them. It should also be noted that they'd been trying to find another publisher well before they brought it to West End Games, but Greg's success with Bug-Eyed Monsters earned them the opportunity to get it published by West End Games. Next up, Greg designed the game Tune for Steve Jackson Games. Released in 1984, he has stated on more than one occasion that he felt the game system was largely arbitrary and that it was the theme behind the game that was the most important thing. Now, we discussed Tune when we did the timeline for role-playing games earlier on, so refer back to the mid-1980s episode in the archives if you want more information. Moving back to Greg and moving back to West End Games, Kostikian designed the Star Wars role-playing game, which dropped in 1987. However, he didn't stick around to enjoy the success. Both Kostikian and Goldberg chose to leave West End Games in January of 1987. They formed the short-lived company Goldberg Associates. Moving forward, Greg took on a pseudonym for his next game. Using the name Designer X, he was responsible for the game Violence, which was published by Hogshead Publishing in 1999. Violence, with the subtitle The Role-Playing Game of Egregious and Repulsive Bloodshed, is really an unplayable game. And that's by design. 
Violence is a rant against the traditional styles of Dungeons & Dragons, the Grand Theft Auto video game series, and MMORPGs. Kostikian has stated that the game was written to simultaneously annoy, enrage, and challenge the reader. If you can find it, pick it up. You might be able to play it, but it's going to be an interesting read. Now, I mentioned during the bankruptcy of West End Games that Kostikian and Goldberg sued to get the rights to Paranoia back, and they were successful in 2000. They then licensed Paranoia to Mongoose Publishing, who've been producing new content for the game since 2004. Kostikian moved on, becoming the CEO of Manifesto Games, which was a startup devoted to providing a viable path to market for independently developed computer games. While there, he worked as a consultant for several years, helping others to get their games to market. Eventually, he joined Guerrilla Apps as the lead game designer in March of 2010, helping them develop the game Trash Tycoon for Facebook. Hey, I think I played that game. In May of 2011, he joined Disney Playdom as their senior games designer. Then in January 2014, took the same role at Loop Drop. In June of 2015, he joined Boss Fight Entertainment as senior games designer. As of 2019, Kostikian and Goldberg both joined Playable Worlds, a gaming startup focused on producing, ironically enough, an MMORPG. As of this airing, that game has no name and no release date. Greg Kostikian has written four novels. Another Day, Another Dungeon, released in 1990, and its sequel, One Quest, Hold the Dragons, released in 1995. He also wrote By the Sword in 1993, and his latest, First Contract, released in 2000. He also wrote a non-fiction book, Uncertainty in Games, which looks at the role of uncertainty in game development. It was published in paperback in 2015. He's also written for numerous publications covering the topics of games, game design, and game industry business issues. Kostikian has also lectured on game design at a number of universities. Among them are the Copenhagen ITU, Helsinki University of Art and Design, RPI, and Stony Brook University. He speaks frequently at game industry events such as the Game Developers Conference and E3. Greg has picked up five Origins Awards over the years, as well as the Game Developer's Choice Awards Maverick Award for his effort to create a viable channel for independent games. He was also inducted into the Adventure Gaming Hall of Fame in 1999. Greg's been married to Louise Disbro, who's a securities analyst, since 1986, and they have three children together. And that, kids, is what we've got on Greg Kostikian. So with that, we come to the end of today's tour. So I spoiled it earlier, but next week we're getting paranoia. So go ahead and make sure your meds are refilled before we do next week's episode. Special shout out to the crew at Critical Role. They don't need it from me, but y'all know how I tend to shout out the creators I watch and listen to while I do my own creating. And I've been enjoying Campaign 3, which just started, and I've been going back to catch Campaign 2, which I'd only seen highlights of before. You can catch them live Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Central Time on their Twitch channel, but their episodes are also available for free the following Monday on YouTube. Okay, so looking at the Thanksgiving Friday episode, I got four more suggestions. Games based on literature... Specialty Games for Fandoms, the game Pendragon, and Games for Younger Kiddos. I'm going to be honest, whether one of those gets voted in or not, I could see all four of those being episodes down the line. But I will add them to the Spotify poll, so you can head on over there and vote. As always, thank you for your continued support. We're gaining a few more listeners every week, and those gains make me want to keep doing this. Also, you might have noticed that with one exception, I laid off the profanity this week. I got an at from one of our listeners who reminded me that I said early on I was going to try to keep this podcast more kid-friendly and asked me why I'd gotten away from that the last couple of weeks. So, having been sufficiently shamed, I'm back to using my brain to come up with better words to express my thoughts. And thank you for the gentle reminder. Oh, and TikTok. Yeah, not, not up yet. 
Sorry. One, one more week, I promise. I had too much cuteness overload with my grandson this week. I mean, he's 12 weeks old, so cut me some slack. Anyway, you can follow us on Facebook at Role Playing History Podcast. Tweet us at Role Playing P. YouTube, Role Playing History Podcast, and you know what to do when you get there. You can email us, Role Playing History Podcast at gmail.com. Next week, it's Paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> I picked a fine week to stop drinking. Anyway, that's next week. Until then, I'm Wayne Davis and your role-playing history. Mm-hmm.